I was already in love with Indiana limestone when I came to Bloomington for graduate work. The limestone keeps me here and calls me back when I leave. When I carve a different type of stone, I miss it. I fell in love with limestone for the bite of a sharp chisel into the even soft rock and the meditative trance of repetitive work. <sighs> Many people ask me, isn't limestone a dying art? This hits me at my core. His human history is written in the stone. The stone has shaped us as much as we have shaped it. Here we are in limestone country, where the surface of the earth is turned inside out, and blocks of stone are sliced out of the ground like pieces of a giant sheet cake. I like to think about limestone. This is the world's largest anatomically correct stone brain. <laughs> I designed it for the Department of Psychology and Brain Sciences at Indiana University. You can visit it on campus. Just as our brains are where memory is stored, so is Indiana limestone a holder of memory. It has geologic memory. You can count the tides in the pattern of the drifts. The stone was formed when this piece of earth was close to the equator some 380 million years ago under a warm, shallow sea. The cycle of life and death produced a deep, wide, and homogeneous deposit of fossilized remains. You can find the shapes of ancient crinoids and delicate fan-like bits of bryozoans. The stone was once alive, and I feel that energy in it still. The stone is also the holder of cultural memory, being the fabric of many United States landmarks and memorials, the places where we connect and form a national identity. Here's the figure group on Grand Central Station in New York City, in place and in progress in the mill here in Monroe County. The Empire State Building is faced with Indiana limestone. The quarry that the stone came out of has been left, a silent inward reflection of this iconic skyscraper. A walk through local cemeteries provides a tour of limestone carving. Limestone likes to imitate trees, creating bark easily in the way it breaks. In Bedford, just south of here in the stone belt, is a memorial to a young stonecutter named Baker who was killed suddenly. His banker, the wooden table used to support his work, is replicated as he left it, down to his apron, tools, and the bent over nails. Listen to the stone. I am enthralled by swinging a hammer, by the bounce of a hammerhead off the end of the chisel. When you hit a good piece of stone just right, it rings. You can tell the quality of a good carver by these striking noises. I anticipate the pop at the moment when eons of togetherness part and a chunk of stone flies free. It's both humbling and deeply pleasurable. You are all shapers of stone. Your feet are slowly dishing stone steps as you walk up and down. The old limestone sidewalks that still exist here and there in Bloomington are worn lower than the cement between the pavers. You are adding to the polishing and oiling anywhere the stone is touched over and over. Notice where the stone is smoothed and darkened by decades of hands grabbing the same spot to swing in through a door or around a corner. These are a few of my reliquaries, a word I made up for these interactive sculptures that are meant to be touched. 
there's one set up in the lobby. Roll the ball and be a part of the creative process. When I carve a roll of query, I'm always thinking about the point at the center of the sphere, moving the forms in towards this point until they seemingly click into place. Look closely at the oldest stone buildings on the Indiana University campus and in Bloomington. These stones were shaped by steam-driven machines at the turn of the 20th century. Many of these machines are still in use, now converted to electricity. The finish work and detail on these buildings was done by hand with wooden mallet and tempered steel chisels. Notice the textures and tool marks left by these tools. The play of light and dark gives life to the building and its ornament. I've heard old timers in the stone industry say that the best stone is under the courthouse square. I thought this was a legend or perhaps a jibe at local government, but in fact, they were right. I finally saw a piece of stone mined under downtown Bloomington, and it is beautiful with a creamy color and a tight grain. For now, it's out of reach, deep under our feet here in the Buzzkirk Chumley Theater. So, my answer to the question of, is stone carving a dying art, is this. Here I am, one face of the living skills and necessary passion. I work with my brothers and sisters in the stone community to keep it vital and to introduce it to as many people as possible. Here in limestone country is a busy industry with a global impact. Technology has improved production in many ways, but nothing can replace a carver's hands, eyes, and heart.